Good evening and welcome to uh, the Scattered Church as we again continue to worship through social distancing. Uh, a couple of announcements just want to remind you, you've probably seen it on Facebook by now a few times, that we're going to have a drive-in movie theater style worship service on Easter where we will do communion together. So very excited about that. Uh, there will be more information coming out in the near future, so be watching for updates on that on both Facebook and on the uh, brand new website that launched uh, during this time as well. Uh, I want to remind everyone that if you have the Version Bible app on your smartphone or tablet or just online at mybible.com, you can um, join the online Bible study that many of our, our, our um, Cornerstone family are, are doing together. Also, um, I want to remind you that if, you, if you're looking for some great Christian music to listen to, there's a Spotify playlist out there of all the music you would hear our worship team play throughout any of our worship services throughout the year. So you can check that out. Also, I, I want to remind two last, two last quick announcements. Number one is um, make sure that we, when you take time right now, maybe pause the video or log on on a different device. You can uh, do your tithes and offerings through PushPay. Really simple platform for giving. You can also just mail a check to the office. Uh, it was funny, one person I was talking to said, I don't know how to do tithes and offerings. And I said, well, you just mail us a check. And they said, you mean like in the mail? And yeah, it still works. So um, make sure you do those things and honors God as, as the scripture tells us, you know, a tithe is very biblical. And the last thing is if you want to help with the meals that we're serving both uh, or any Monday for lunch, Wednesday dinner and Saturday breakfast that we're serving here at Cornerstone. Um, please contact the church office so uh, Sue can Sue's working on keeping all that stuff scheduled. So we we maintain social distancing and that less than ten people together um, atmosphere that our president has asked us to do. And Kelly, you're up. All right. So once again, good evening and welcome to worship. We're glad to have you guys here. Just picking off of uh, what Steve said. Just one more thing on the giving. There is a link in the post right above if you're watching on Facebook. So go ahead and click that. Then in regards to social distancing, you may notice that we are missing a big chunk of our team today. Everybody's fine. Everybody's healthy. We've just decided to better comply with social distancing and reducing our numbers that we won't have full teams. We'll be rotating smaller teams. So you have Dave and I today, but you'll have a new team um, on Sunday. So other than that, let's uh, go ahead and open up with a word of prayer as we get started with worship this evening. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to gather together in worship. And Lord, we wish it was together in person, but Father, we're so grateful for this technology, for, for things like the Bible app, things like online services, Spotify, all of these things, Lord, that keep us connected. And and keep us focused on you, focused on discipleship, and focused on worship. So, Father, as we just enter into this time of corporate worship, Lord, I pray that your name would be glorified, you'd be magnified, you'd be lifted high with our worship. Lord, it's your name we pray. Amen. Children, generations, 
so grateful, God, that through all circumstances in life that you are with us. Lord, you've promised to never leave us and never forsake us. So, Father, we worship, we praise, we adore you. Father, we pray that, that this evening our worship was beautiful to your ears. And, Lord, as I uh, prepared for the message tonight, Lord, I just submit myself to your authority. I ask you to use me in a powerful way, Lord, to bring the truth of your word to life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So uh, here we go. Um, getting back into the book of Acts. Acts chapter 9 is where we are at. Um, so if you want to grab your Bibles, uh, I'd love to see a picture of your Bibles, maybe some highlighted scriptures or whatever, as you uh, take time to check in the media cornerstone and let everyone know that uh, we're still here and we're still worshiping. So um, please do those things. We're in Acts chapter 9, and, and, and God is now ready to appoint a highly trained, full-time missionary to the Gentiles. He selects Saul of Tarsus and changes his life to fit his role. What's important here is we remember that we, we refer to Saul as Saul the persecutor. And now we're going to see how God uses uh, even those who persecute the church for his will. Um, so we're going to kind of break down Acts chapter 9 into some chunks. The first chunk is 1 through 10. Verses 1 through 10 is really Saul um, encounter, encounters Jesus, all right? So I want to look specifically at verses 1 and 2 right now. It says, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found anyone belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. All right, so again, I've pointed out throughout the book of Acts where we find egalitarian languaging. We see the same thing right here. Saul wasn't discriminating men or women. If you followed Jesus, you were going to jail and or death. Saul's intention was to completely wipe out the way um, imprisoning and or killing anyone who follows the name of Jesus. All right, so he's, he's on his way. I love what the, uh, the Holman commentary says. It says, Tough and crafty, this young rabbi from Tarsus zealously wanted to exterminate Christians. He had no intention of letting the persecution of the church end with the death of Stephen and the expulsion of believers from Jerusalem. So, so, if you remember, Stephen is, cruci or, uh, is martyred, and uh, now here we go. Saul is, is going to continue to hunt down anyone who follows the name of Jesus. Uh, verses 3 through 9, the rest of the section is Saul's converted, um, conversion on the way to Damascus. All right? So follow along with your Bible. And again, yeah, I know we have extra time at home right now, so spend some extra time reading, reading the whole chapter here. But... Uh, most of us know the story of Saul's conversion. There's a, there's a bright flash of light. There's a loud, thunderous voice from heaven. And uh, I love the, this, this vocal exchange that takes place between 
God and Saul. Uh, God says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? To which Saul replies, who are you, Lord? And then there's a lot of great debate that goes on here. If Saul meant Lord, lowercase l, as a person of respect, or capital L, Lord, as in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I tend to think, when I look at the full picture, right, put it in context, there's a bright light, there's a voice from heaven, he, you know, there's a blinding light going on. I think Saul understood, uh, again, and he's, he, would, he would have been through all the religious training, um, so he understood that this is Lord, capital L, I believe that. To which the Lord responds, I am Jesus the one you're persecuting. Now, Saul never actually persecuted Jesus, so we need to understand that, again, this is this mentality that um, that which is done to the least of them is done unto me, says the Lord. Um, and, and here is Saul's persecuting believers. Jesus is saying, you are persecuting me personally. So still in shock, Saul is sent into the city. He goes to Damascus. Um, this is the first command the Lord gives Saul in his life, and the first of many, right? Go, go into the city. Saul opens his eyes. He's unable to see. He's blind. He did not eat, did not drink for three days while he was blind. But Luke also makes mention here, and I, I always find this interesting when you, when you look at the stories and how you weave in and out of things, that Luke mentions, that makes it a point to, to mention that those traveling with Saul were able to hear the voice, but they saw nothing. Okay, so so he, he points out that like the, the, the posse, the crew, those who are going to actually, you know, take care of the prisoners, they they um they heard the voice, right? So they, they know something's going on. All right, then we're going on to verses 9, 10 through 19. We're going to 19a. Um, it's Saul's conversion and a dude named Ananias from Damascus, all right? Uh, again, I'm going to read this quote of the, of the Holman Commentary because I think it's so excellent. God not only selects and calls people who will serve him in a visible and public way, but he also, those who support the work behind the scenes, like little known Ananias of Damascus. Right? And again, there's a great conversation that takes place here. Um, uh, the Lord calls to him in a vision, he says, Ananias! And I love Ananias' response, here I am, Lord. And he's like, here I am. I'm right here, God. Then the Lord gives him instructions to go and find Saul, praying, lay hands on him so he'll regain his sight. 913 is, I think, one of the coolest exchanges uh, in Scripture. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. In other words, um, and nice to say, look, God, if I go and do this, this guy's going to kill me. This guy's going to put me to death. This is what he is here for, is to stomp out the way. But in verses 15 and 16, we, we get a glimpse into what Paul, Saul's life's going to become. Um, and it says this, verse 15, it's 9, 15, and 16. But the Lord said to him, him being Ananias, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. I, what great insight into the life Paul's going to live. He will suffer for the name of Jesus. Likewise, I think, I think the coronavirus, this COVID-19, uh, has taken the world by guard because we think, how can this be? Right? But you know what? There is suffering. There's uncomfortableness. There's, there's things in this world that don't make sense to us. And I'm not saying God made COVID-19, but God's going to use it for good. And we are going to go through some uncomfortable times. We are going to go through difficult times. Jesus said it himself in John 16, 33, um, In this world you will have trouble, but take courage. I will overcome the world. Right? So here we are, this is exactly what's going on, and if we're living transformed lives, committed to the Great Commission, we're going to go through some stuff, all right? It's plain and simple. It's time and time again we see that. I noticed another fascinating development here where Saul, the unbeliever, was absolutely shocked to hear uh, even a few words from the mouth of Jesus, but Ananias, 
seems to enter comfortably into a conversation as though they were speaking to a member of his family. And there's two very different conversations that take place between the believer and the non-believer. Ananias finds Saul exactly where God said he would be. He kind of tells Saul, I love this, he kind of tells Saul, Saul, he's like, hey Saul, I'm the guy, God sent me to you um, so I can pray for you, to lay my hands on you, and you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so this happens, and something like scales falls from his eyes, and he's able to see again. Right, so now Saul's regained sight, it says he was baptized, and then ate to regain strength. And I, I find it interesting, the, the, the order of operations for your math majors out there, right? Baptized, and then decided to take care of some food after he had eaten for three days. Um, 19b through 25 is the next section we're going to look at. This is where Saul starts to proclaim uh, the message of the Messiah. I love verse 20, right? It says, immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying he is the Son of God. And this is one of the few places in Scripture where we find the phrase, Son of God, as Saul is declaring this. Uh, Saul, or Paul, went right to work proclaiming the Savior, whom he had so recently condemned. In just a few days, the center of his message developed that Jesus is the Son of God. The theme, however, is interesting since it's only here in Acts do we see Jesus proclaimed as the Son of God. Paul, Saul, however you want to phrase his name at this point, understood an insight to Jesus that we need to grab a hold of, that he is, in fact, the Son of God. Uh, verse 9.22, Saul, it says, Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus for proving that Jesus was the Christ. Not arguing, not convincing, but proving that Jesus is the Christ. So Saul finds himself in a very unique situation. The religious leaders are obviously not happy with him now speaking about the way. Um, the, the Jews inside the city are not happy about him speaking about the way. In fact, it says in, in, um, in this next section here that the Jews actually made a plan to kill Saul. They had enough of his teaching. They were like, stop talking about this Messiah. We're actually going to kill you. So the persecutor now becomes a persecutee, right? They, they, they had this plan to kill him. They got people watching the gates, waiting for the right opportunity to kill Saul. Uh, his disciples, him and his disciples find out about this. and they, they, um, His disciples actually, when they lower him through a basket, through a hole in the wall, so he could escape. All right, so now Saul is not welcome by the Jews, not welcome by the religious leaders. So where does he go? Verses 26 through 31. Saul goes to Jerusalem, right? The, the place, Pentecost, just happened there not too long ago. But check out verse 26. When he, again being Saul, had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe he was a disciple. And I think often when I read this passage of what happened with Kanye West, when he decided to stop making secular music and only do Christian music, it wasn't the secular world that was up in arms. It was the Christians. Is it real? How long is he going to put on this, this facade? Um, could God really, I think my favorite one I ever read was, could God really save someone like Kanye West? And I'm like, well, he saved someone like me, so yes, right? And Saul finds himself in a very similar situation. It is the believers who are struggling the most. So we see that the Jews hated him and tried to kill him. The Christians don't believe him. Suffering for the sake of the gospel. You know, and I'm sure for Saul's life, it felt like, what's next? No one, no one will work with me. But then enters a guy by the name of Barnabas. 927. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who had spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. And so Barnabas shared with the disciples how the Jews tried to kill him, how he how he had his radical conversion, how his life was completely different. Um, and the brothers listened, and they finally sent Saul down to Tarsus. All right? So Saul's off to Tarsus. 
the, 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 the disciples are still in Jerusalem. And again, I want to point out verse 931. This is what happens when there's unity in the body of Christ. 931. So the church throughout all of Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in fear of the Lord and in comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. I'm longing for the day when the body of Christ will rise up, walk in the fear of the Lord, in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and see multiplication. All right, for the sake of time, I'm, I'm going to briefly go through 32 through 43. This is probably not, the, not a fair way to address this, uh, but for time dictates some things. And, and all of a sudden, Luke's writing, it flips back to Peter. All right, so Peter ends up in, in, in Lydda, and heals a man who's been bedridden for eight years named Aeneas. Okay, so all of a sudden, again, we see this big flip in, in Luke's writing. He's Saul, 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 Saul goes to Tarsus. Peter goes and heals someone who's, who's been in bed for eight years, right? He can't get out of bed. He's been bedridden. And then Peter, while well, he's there, is someone to Joppa, which is not that far away, where a disciple named Tabitha has died, okay? Um, Peter goes and tells her... Um, Tells her to get up, and she's brought back to life. Right? He's Tabitha, arise. So uh, what's interesting to me is, again, for, for people who don't believe in egalitarian ministries, we, we see a disciple named Tabitha, and, and Peter brings her back to life. Right? Like God does not discriminate against sexes and creeds and all that kind of stuff. Right? And then, and then so... so Acts chapter 9 ends with, with Peter staying in Joppa with a guy named Simon a leather tanner. Okay? So uh, what is what is our application for tonight? In Acts 19, B, we see Saul spent time with the disciples in Damascus. He's learning to be a disciple. What's a disciple? Here's, here's how we define a disciple here at Cornerstone. A disciple is someone learning to think, act, and react like Jesus everywhere they go. And we see this play out throughout Paul's life if you've read the whole book of Acts. Um, C.S. Lewis in the Screwtape Letters has, has an interesting thought on discipleship. He's talking about how, it, it, how it, when someone's converted to Christianity, um, the only way we, start, we have to get them to backslide right away because they become much less, as C.S. Lewis says, they become much less dependent on emotion and therefore much harder to attempt. Right? And oftentimes, I think Christians are living in the emotional instead of in the spiritual. And, and so what C.S. Lewis is saying is, we want to, the, the, the adversary, Beelzebub, Wormwood, you know, all, if you, if you read the book, you know what I'm talking about. It's hard for Christians to backslide when they move from an emotional connection to God to a physical, spiritual connection to God. All right? Next point is be ready when... Um, when you least expect it, God will call you for a very special task. Um, three weeks ago, when we got together and started talking about what this church looked like if this COVID-19 thing goes the way it looked like it was and turned out it went that way. And we had to be ready for a special task that God's given us, like converting the chapel into a recording studio, um, learning how to do drive-in meals, not just for ours, but for other meals, you know. The first week we did four different meals, now we're up to just three a week. But we had to be ready in season and out of season, as the scripture talks about. When God has chosen a person, we have no basis to reject that one. People rejected Saul because of who he was. People rejected Kanye West because of who he was. People reject Steve Oster because of who he was. Right? We can't do that as Christians. That's not, it's not biblical. And then finally, the last thing is, um, when faced with difficult ministry tasks, pray first. We need to be a people of prayer. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for the opportunity to share your word. I thank you for uh, our beautiful church family, Lord, that, that we just love and cherish each other and we miss each other deeply at this time. And Father, we, we are so looking forward to that celebration of coming back together. But Lord, this is the season we're in right now, so we trust that you are on the throne, 
that you are in complete control of this, Father. And Lord, I pray that you would just be with us, Lord, as we live out being the scattered church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you all. Have a great night. God bless.